Good morning, and welcome. Good to see you all this morning here. We've been going through in Peter, as Peter lays out eight virtues that really build upon one another and should be things that are increasing in each one of our lives. And we'll be continuing with that this morning, looking at the virtue of controlling the self or self-control. But before we get into God's word, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we pray that as we work our way through this area and we hear what some of the scholars have to say, as we look at what each one of these words mean and what your scriptures say in regards to it, we pray that each one of us might grow. And Father, help us to understand, especially as we go through this area, that of self-control, that it's one that so very many struggle with in their lives. And we pray that they might break free, that they might understand their position in Christ and the freedom that has been purchased for them. And Father, we pray that this might be a time when many gain control of self. Lord, that they might master it. And as a result of that, that they might break habits or different areas of sin in their life that they've battled with for maybe many years. And so now as we spend this time together, Father, we'd ask that you would bless our time. Give us ears to hear what your spirit longs to say I pray that as we touch on these things that there would be a greater desire within each one's heart to study it out further. Father, that by it they, they may grow in respect to their salvation and maturity in Christ. And we pray for the other Bible-believing churches in Dubuque, asking your blessing upon them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are looking... <clears throat> in Peter, Second Peter, and Peter exhorts us, as we have mentioned over past weeks, he exhorts us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is in, as he finishes off that letter, but at the beginning of that very letter, he addresses some things that we are to grow in. And he begins with the foundation of faith, a strong conviction and trust in both God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Then to that faith, he adds the quality of virtue or excellence, which is a desire for excellence, a striving to become all that Christ desires of us. And each one of us, we need to look at that and ask, where do I fit? What do I look like spiritually? How am I growing? What areas do I need to grow in? Because we're all unique. And we all come from different backgrounds, and those different backgrounds and the sins that we have uh, performed, if you will, in the past have been used to mold and shape our character and when we come into Christ, we bring that with us, and that's, those are areas that Christ wants to transform or change. And so to that all, while we are increasing in knowledge, which is gaining the awareness and understanding through study and experience, especially regarding the will of God and the way of salvation, and the will of God be in our, not only our reaching the world with the gospel, but uh, our growing up in Christ. And in my years as a Christian, I've seen many, many Christians that are uh, content 
with, for the most part, remaining as they were the day they got saved. And so their character really hasn't changed. And God desires of us that as we would grow, if indeed we are growing, that we would be coming, be becoming more like him, that we would be experiencing a transition or a transformation where it's not just something that we know, but something that is literally transforming us. You know, I remember as a young father showing my children, we would watch this uh, video, an animated video called Katie the Caterpillar. And Katie the Caterpillar was frustrated with where she was in life. She didn't like what she was. She looked around and she saw how the birds could fly and she really, really desired to fly like the birds. And then she looked around and she saw how busy the bees were and she really wanted to be more like the bees that could be busy and produce things. And she looked all around her and saw all these different things that weren't her, that she didn't possess. And she desired each one of these. So the one day she decides she's going to leave home. And she's going to venture out and try to find that which will complete her, satisfy her, meet those deepest longings, if you will, in her heart. And she goes out and, of course, she gets involved in a beehive and she finds out that the bees don't like her because she's different. And so after a few stings and whatnot, she decides this isn't the place for me. I don't want to be like the bees. And then she goes and she tries to make friends with the birds and they see her as something edible. And she decides that that's not what she wants to be. She never planned on being on somebody's dinner table. And so she goes through seeking and trying and seeking and trying. And finally, when she's exhausted, she says, I'm just going to be me. And I'm going to be the best me that I can be. And so she goes back and she's really tired and she climbs up in the tree and she spins this little cocoon that she starts to live in. And sometime later, all of a sudden, she breaks out of that cocoon and she's a butterfly. And she can fly like the birds and she can be busy and go all over the place and she's got all the beauty of the other things that she saw in some of the things like salamanders, you know, that could change their color and, and all of this stuff. And she found that everything she desired all of a sudden was now something that she had when she resolved to be content with who God made her to be. You know, and a lot of that is like us. We seek and we try and we seek and we try and if only I can get more money, then I can be content. And if I can get more of this, I can be content. And if I can gain more knowledge for the sake of knowing, I can be content. And we pursue and we add to our collection and we find that we're ever seeking and never finding that which makes us content until we get to that point when we just let go and say, okay, God, I'm all yours. What do you want me to be? And when we resolve ourselves to become the person that God wants us to be, we find all of the contentment and all of the things, if you will, that God had for us from the very beginning. As we battle as a Christian, the Christian life is a, is a fight. It's a fight to become more like Christ as we war, if you will, against our own flesh. You know, there are things that 
everybody in here, I'm sure, would like to change. For some, it might be addictions. And we'll touch more on some of those areas here shortly. But for some, we're, we've got issues in our life that we want to change. And though we try and try and try and try again, we never seem to be able to break free. And so we say, well, this is just the way I am. And I want to tell you something this morning. The way you am is not the way that you were meant to be. Okay? The way you are today is not the way that you were meant to be. God wants more out of our life. And he wants to take this little old caterpillar, if you will, and make it into something beautiful that attracts the attention of a world that is lost and perishing, that they might come to know the one that created you and changed you. And in a life that's changed, God receives great glory. And so we can try as we will to overcome issues of anger or issues of lust or whatever, and we can sometimes reform a little bit and get a little better at it where we're not doing it as much, or we can be transformed by applying certain things that the scriptures teach us that our lives can be totally different. So, let me ask you, what good is just having knowledge, knowledge of good and evil, if you will, if you do not have the ability or the proper method, if you will, proper use of such knowledge. You know, way back in the beginning, remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden and Satan said to them, if you eat of this, you'll be like God knowing good and evil. You'll have the knowledge. What he didn't tell them is, yes, you will have the knowledge, but you will no longer have the ability or the power within yourself to make the choice to do the good. So it's one thing to know. It's another thing to be able to do. And God, at that very point in time, promised a Savior who would come and die for us and rise again. And then by our put, placing our faith in him, we would be renewed and given a new nature. So now you can have that victory. You can have that victory in your life. Consider the definition of self-control, the Greek word enkratea, from the uh, word kratos, meaning strength. Strength. We are to have this strength, if you will, in our life. And as defined by various scholars, A.T. Roberts says, A.T. Robertson says, one holding himself in. Okay, you might want to do this. You might feel tempted to do this. You might have, let's say, for an example, with an anger issue where you are going to do this. This is the way you are. And he says self-control is having the strength to hold that in. It's the virtue, according to Thayer, it's the virtue of one who masters his desires and passion especially essential appetites. And you know, we all have those areas in our life that we struggle with. McKnight says, where one virtue subsists or abides, temptation can have little influence. 
where self-control has been developed in your life, temptation doesn't have the strength to overcome anymore. We see it in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, it says, And as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. And the word follows righteousness. Self-control follows righteousness, which represents God's claim. Okay? It represents God's claim on you, and self-control is man's response, if you will, to God. So God has the right. You have been purchased with a price. If you are born again, you have been purchased with a price a very dear price. 